Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and. Uh, Thank you for uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to come here. So um, I will um, I will spend some time, uh, and it's good to come back actually because I was here last time as well. Uh, so I will repeat some of the things that I presented last time. So uh, the ambition for today is to talk about the transition to green for shipping. So why uh, is it difficult? How and how can be uh, how can it be done? And what are we doing uh, in uh, in Oddfjell, uh, the name of our company? So. Um, uh, Oddfjell is a 107-year-old company. We operate uh, ships like uh, you see on the on the screen here. We operate about 90 of these vessels. They crisscross the world, uh, uh, all all around the world, and they transport chemicals. They transport chemicals that we use every every day. Uh, everything from uh, uh, used into food to plastics to clothes to cars, and this is industrial products that goes into everything that we do and we touch uh, every day. So we represent shipping, and the shipping industry uh, is about uh, depends a little bit on, on what size you're talking about, but it's more than 100,000, uh, close to 100,000 uh, different vessels. Uh, they crisscross the world with products all around the world, and about 90% uh, of all products that you surround yourself with has been on board a vessel. Um, Due to the size and efficiency of a vessel, that means that there are no other more uh, environmentally friendly way of transporting large volume over large distances than you can do with a vessel. So shipping is a part of the solution in order to reduce footprints of products. And it's the most environmentally friendly way of transporting goods. But shipping also represents about 2% of the global CO2 emissions. So shipping is also a part of the problem. And that's kind of the important things uh, for shipping going forward. About a year ago, I saw this um, cartoon, and I'll share it with you, uh, and uh, where it illustrates the world was fighting COVID at that time. Where we are now and what we have experienced this summer, I think that that switch has been, ha has been done. So the big guy is really, really on the stage at the moment. So I think that that is also what's driving us. It has been driving Oddfjell for several years. We have put climate risk on the agenda, and it's integrated into our strategy work. But I think this is just a, a very good illustration, and it's also a good illustration that that switch of these two guys actually have, hap have happened. So uh, where are we? Uh, and uh, it's not a should be a preaching to the choir at this conference, but uh, most of you uh, most of you know this. We do a lot of things. There are a lot of pleasures. There are a lot of commitments, but we're still missing a lot of CO2 that uh, remains to be reduced. And the challenging thing with CO2 is that. It remains so long in the atmosphere. It has remained in the atmosphere for, for 100 years. So if we stopped everything uh, of CO2 today, the temperature will still increase. Uh, and all the, the trajectories presented by the IPCC uh, shows that the temperature will increase in all scenarios. So that means that we need to do something about it. And this is kind of like the global picture. Um, and how is shipping uh, build coming into these pictures? Where are the pledges and commitments uh, if you look at the shipping industry? Are we doing any better? No, we're not. So, as this graph shows, the shipping industry will contribute to, a, to, the, to the brown bars on the top here, and we're talking about four degree scenario with the current pledges in place for shipping. And that means that shipping really has to do something. And that's why we in Oddfjell have set a zero target and 50, and I'm coming back to that uh, later. And there's a lot of targets out there that is really driving the regulation. One of the targets is the uh, target set by the EU uh, with a 55% 50, uh, reduction. Um, remember that the Paris Agreement, which a lot of, of people refer to, did not uh, include shipping. Because shipping is a, is, a, is a global business, and it was difficult for governments, because governments is committing to the Paris Agreement. And it's difficult for the different governments to commit shipping. So that means that the only one that can regulate shipping is the IMO, and that, uh, the International Maritime Organization under UN. And that means that in uh, 2018, the IMO came out with their targets, and their targets were talking about a 40% reduction of carbon intensity and a 50% reduction in absolute numbers. So 
this target, that reflects the graph that I showed you earlier. So it, 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 this, this is not enough. The nature doesn't really care about carbon intensity. Carbon intensity is a very good measure to measure the efficiency, to measure where your progression, to measure trajectory and your own KPIs. But in order to have a good carbon intensity, you can only build a bigger ship. Uh, and that means that your intensity comes down, but the absolute will grow. So that's why the absolute number is there. Uh, so, uh, but a 50% reduction is, is not sufficient, as I showed you on the graph. That's why we in Oldfield have set a zero target. And how to get there? That is, uh, we, we have a lot of ideas and a lot of plans. We have a very good plan in order to achieve a, a carbon intensity reduction. But how do we meet zero? And I'll explain a little bit why that is a problem. The problem is that when we are planning to build a ship, these ships are capital in in incentive, uh, intensive. They, it's, it's, they are very expensive. So it's a lot of planning when we're going to do uh, a, a capital expenditure project. Uh, and these ships, they will last for 20, 30 years. And what kind of technology, what, what would you bet on today? Uh, that is, a, that is a, a major challenge. So what kind of technology would you use to select the, the next vessel? Uh, in order to be green, you need to be green in a total value chain. I think that is a, uh, a, one of the most under-communicated challenges that we have seen. Uh, because everyone is talking about buying green fuels, uh, I need, uh, or buying fuel, I'm going to for an alternative fuel, we're going to be zero at that time. Uh, and so and so at a different milestone. And from a shipping perspective, from we can have a zero fuel uh, that's coming on board or our tanks, and it can be zero uh, when it comes to the propeller. So from a tank to wake perspective, we can think of this product as a, as a zero product. But if it requires a lot of CO2 in order to produce that fuel, then, then the, we have not uh, solved the problem. And that is the well-to-tank perspective. Uh, and, uh, and that is the, one of the major challenges. And I'll show you a little bit some of the examples that we're talking about when we're talking about alternative fuels. Because when we're talking about alternative fuels, some of these fuels are not uh, any better than the diesel oil that we are using today. So this is the headache that's on shipper, ship owners' agenda. This is the Global Maritime Forum's issue map, uh, which should present the... Um, uh, the issues on, on, uh, on the shipping agenda. And as you will see on this graph, decarbonization and regulation following decarbonization of our industry, that's the number one issue for, uh, for ship owners and shipping industry all over the world. So when we're talking about alternative fuel, what is an alternative fuel? Alternative to what? Uh, I'm taking a deep sea perspective, and deep sea perspective is the, is the, the, the big vessels that cross the Atlantic. Uh, a different uh, perspective would be if you're doing a, a local ferry. Local ferries, they can go on batteries. In Norway, we have uh, several ferries uh, that's running, running on batteries, and I'm trying to uh, come back to an example on that later. Uh, but for deep sea um, uh, and, and longer distance travels, we're talking about uh, uh, alternative fuel, and we're talking about alternative is the alternative to the traditional diesel oil that we are using today, or the very, lo very low sulfur fuel oil that we're using today. So this graph might be a little bit difficult to see, but what you see here is that the top fuels there, these are e-fuels. These fuels have been produced uh, uh, by uh, electrolysis, and I'll explain why uh, that is uh, the, the pros and cons of that. The next ones are biofuels, and then you have the diesels that we are using today, and a lot of people talk about LNG as the solution. The LNG will reduce the CO2 a little bit, but it's not the solution. It will be a, a, a transitional fuel going forward. So LNG will not solve the problem. It can solve your kind of trajectory problem for the next 10 years, but after that you will struggle since the requirements is also increasing. So as an example, some of these biofuels that we're talking about, a biodiesel, uh, it takes a lot of energy in order to produce that. This study shows that it's 263% of diesel in order to produce biofuel. So, so it, it, it's not an easy challenge. And, and some of those e-fuels, they require uh, renewable energy. So it's basically hydrogen, and uh, either hydrogen directly, or you can produce green ammonia. Alternative, you can produce an e-fuel, like an e-methanol, 
uh, e-fuels that's mentioned there. And in order to produce that, you will need access to kind of green or biogenic CO2. Uh, and uh, in order to get access to that, that is very limited. It's highly regulated because we don't want to, um, because they don't want land use to be used for, uh, for producing actually CO2. Uh, and as you see in the study by DNV, the uptake on renewable hydrogen is coming very, very late. And this is a very realistic scenario. So, that, so, that, so you see that it will require access to a lot of, of uh, hydrogen, and uh, the, that production facilities and capacity is not really there. And then you need green energy. You need renewable energy. And the amount of, of energy available today uh, where, where uh, renewable energy is a very, very small part. And let's take an, an example. If we wanted to take the global fleet and, uh, and let it run on green ammonia, which could be a scenario going forward for some vessels, it will require, last year, they spent about 203 million tons of fuel oil. So let's say if you're going to do alternative to that, that will require 554 ton, million tons of green ammonia. In order to produce that, you will see that you will need 80 million tons of hydrogen. Totally, globally, in the world, it was produced 120. So we're talking only shipping here. And if you're looking at the production, how much of that hydrogen, that the 120 that was produced, was produced green, it's a very, very, very tiny part. Uh, and another example is that if you look at total non-fossil energy production last year, what was about 10,000 terawatt hours. If you wanted to, to run the global shipping on green ammonia using electrolysis, you'd re require 50% of that, or 150% more than the total wind and solar energy that was available and produced last year to solve a problem representing 2%. So that's why we think of a lot of these challenges. It's a policy and a political question as well, because if you have a lot, if politicians has a, has a lot of uh, access to a lot of green energy, where do you want to put it? Where do you get most effect of the green energy? And that's probably not within shipping. And that's the challenge for us uh, being a hard to abate sector. Because if you look at this scale here, you would see that if you, if you use that energy for, for electrical vehicles, the amount of CO2 effect you can get globally, it's much, much bigger effect of using that energy to cars or to replace coal or heating, global transportation, uh, etc., instead of shipping. So that means that we will compete heavily with alternative uh, um, alternative fuels and alternative sources of energy when that is available. So the technology is there for shipping. It, you, can, you can get a ship on the water in a couple of years uh, with the a ability to run on a green fuel, let's say green ammonia, as has been talking about, which is, could be a, a possible solution going forward. Uh, and that, uh, that technology, that needs to be zero capable, and that's what we aim for in Oldfield. We, we see that, that the challenges of infrastructure and access is, is there, so we want to aim for uh, zero capable, that we can easily switch to a green fuel when that is available. But it will require a lot of technology work, and the technology is there, but uh, we need to have fuel flexible engines that can run on different kinds of fuels. We need a fuel system, tanks, etc., that can be run on, on this, and this is uh, this can be available, the, the technology is not there. We say that we need to do R&D as well because we need to understand the effects and how this is done. This is not done in full, in full scale yet, it's done on testing. Uh, so we need to do R&D, but not that much because the technology and understanding is there. So we need to start off scaling this up. Uh, and we also need the access to the fuel. Uh, we need to be able to, to refuel when we're coming into a port. So we need the infrastructure. So uh, from a policy perspective, uh, we see that the fuels that, uh, the alternative fuel that we will get, let's say uh, green ammonia, that is going to be an expensive fuel. Uh, and we believe that all, 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 all energy in the future is going to be more expensive than we experienced for the last period of time. And we, we can see that today, but we, at least green energy or green fuels, zero emission fuels, is going to be much more expensive. And that's why 
one of our pillars, which I come back to, is that we need to be energy as energy efficient as possible, because uh, uh, because of the cost element that it's going to be more expensive. And as long as shipping can have an alternative that is cheaper, they will choose the cheaper alternative because it's a global business. You keep on uh, on competing on a global scale. And that's where we need the policy. So now you're seeing a ship owner that's actually calling for taxes. We're calling for Levi. We, we want to make sure that you have a market-based measures that ensures that the alternative fuel uh, is, a, is on an equal scale as a, a fossil fuel, or else no one will want to buy it. And that's why we need regulation to do that. We need regulations coming from the regulatory body that regulates shipping, and that's not only local governments. Look, uh, about 30% of global shipping is, is local. So that means that the local uh, countries, they have to also come with regulation, as we see with coming out of the EU. But the challenge for a global uh, player like us is that we, um, we operate in many different places. And when the EU comes with a, uh, a tax scheme, there will be a tax scheme in the US. UK have established, uh, planning to establish a, a tax scheme, uh, and also in the China, and uh, many other different places, because it's a source for revenue. Um, and uh, and uh, that's why we think that this has to be done on a global scale. So we need global and regional uh, measures and regulation in order to make sure that we have efficient market that incentivize the use of alternative zero uh, energy fuel sources. One example is green corridors. Uh, a green corridor is as an example from Norway, uh, where we have small ferries crossing the fjords. Uh, and the government said that, okay, uh, in order to compete on that ferry uh, contract, you need to be zero. So the, the, the ferries was not available, there were battery ferries, they were not very efficient, they were not there. But the government said that, okay, we want that, that's what we're going to pay for. And that turned the market. It created a market, it created innovation, and it created a level playing field in order to make sure that that was possible. Today, a lot of ferries crossing the Norwegian fjords are electrical ferries. And that can easily be scaled up. There's programs at the moment to do that crossing uh, the North Sea. Uh, you can have that uh, as, a, as a green corridor between Norway and UK. And we're also looking at longer routes from Rotterdam, Singapore, etc. And that means that there's a mini ecosystem uh, for that route, for that similar trade, where the government and uh, pub uh, public and private go uh, join that project in order to make sure that you have the technology and you create a incentives and models in order to make sure that the alternative fuel, alternative uh, access to the fuel is available and it, as a, it is at a, a um, competitive price. And that means that this can be scaled up. So the policies that I mentioned earlier, I think that green corridors is a measure to do that. But uh, the, there's a lot of plans on green corridors now. We have the Clyde Bank, Clyde Bank Declaration that came out of, of the COP uh, last in November, where a lot of countries have committed to support uh, green corridors. But I think that this is uh, actually it's going to be a, a good solution, but you need actions, and you need to move from policies and ideas in order to, to, to actions. As I said with the example of, of the ferries in, in Norway. So, um, how are we doing in the planning of this in Odfjell? So, sustainability is a part of our integrated uh, uh, strategy. We, it is an integrated part of our sustainability strategy, both on the talent side and sustainability, which is the kind of S and ESG. So, we want to take a leadership position. We want to be ahead. It is an integrated part of our strategy. We also do this materiality assessment. In, in our materiality assessment, we see that decarbonization is really what's high on our agenda. When we're talking to our customers, some of most of our customers, they all really, really care about, as long as you're above the bar on safety and all these things, they, they care about the price. I think there will be changes to that going forward. So we do the materiality assessment uh, and looking what what is material to us. And that goes into our strategy planning together with our climate risk assessments. So we are using the TCFD uh, model for climate risk assessments. This is available on TCFD's websites. Uh, uh, and this is what we have prepared now. We, we're going to have that discussion with our board next week with our climate risk assessment and the input to our, all our different strategy plans. Not only the fleet transition plan, as I mentioned here, uh, because we are looking at especially the policy and legal and technology transitional risk related to climate, but we're also looking at that opportunities. So we are standing before a kind of a big 
change now going into uh, uh, 2023 because you got a lot of new regulations and suddenly there will be incentives for using shipping with a lower emissions and I'm coming back to that with regards to the regulation. So we think about this as a many different routes for energy efficiency and decarbonization both on the fleet composition side that we make sure that we have the most efficient fleet all the time that we are able to uh, to contract different uh, vessels with uh, with the very low emissions uh, we do the technical upgrades last years we have done one more than 100 separate projects of uh, retrofitting our vessels with energy saving devices and for this year we are planned for another 24 that will take us down on, on intensity. It will not solve the problem of being zero, but it will take us much, much more down, uh, and it will make more, us more, much more efficient. And then we have the operational. A lot of, a lot of time is, uh, on the ship is, is spent waiting. So if we, can, uh, if we can optimize that, if we are able to go to use the weather, uh, that's, uh, we have saved a lot on that, just uh, avoiding bad weather, avoiding waves, using the wind, etc and also the digital transformation uh, and because that's a as as one of the previous speakers uh, was talking about the digitalization as a fundament for understanding what we are doing so we need to we have been through a process in order to make sure that we have good data quality uh, and that we are able to collect these data and we are able to process these these data and we are all there at the at the stage two where we are sort of contextualize these data and it gives us access to information it gives us uh, the opportunity to take faster and better decisions from the technology side i think that if we're going forward to that we need to sort of be even better on unlocking that value that the digitalization represents and the access to that data represents so uh, so uh, and developing sustainable uh, sustainability solution based on the, the access of data and based on the capacity of modern IT with artificial intelligence machine learning etc I think that we are standing also uh, in front of a, of a huge untapped potential within digitalization and what we're saying the the twin transition uh, of digitalization and decarbonization so so far uh, here, the, uh, on the last reporting, we are actually 39% down from what we were in 2009, and we were already good at that time. So, Oldfield has done a, a, a very good job, and we are probably one of the uh, one of the really high performers with regards to emission reduction. We we have been able to re reduce the efficient uh, energy efficiency, uh, improve the efficiency, and reduce emissions. And we're using that with simple things like just making sure that we have programs to clean the propeller. That actually gives a lot of effect. It gives several percent effect of actually doing that. And we can train our people through uh, using a virtual reality models. It it it, uh, it helps us getting understanding and access to information um, that we will uh, that will not have. Uh, and uh, and we not uh, and we continue developing that. We have a separate departments in our in our company, looking actually all the time at what's available, what's the what's the opportunities going forward, and trying to develop that business case of uh, of making sure that we, we we get a lot of benefits from the energy uh, improvement. So so far this year, we have seen this is the energy intensity improvement, and this is the energy intensity improvements that we have seen compared to the IMO benchmark, uh, which is we actually report together integrated with our financial reporting as a listed company. Um, we have also done sustainable finance. We were the first company in the world in our industry to link our climate targets to our financing through a sustainability linked financing framework. Uh, and uh, that, was, that framework was awarded by the marine money. Uh, and that gives us a lot of, uh, of good um, uh, good results. The, the bond that we issued was substantially oversubscribed. We attracted a lot of new investors. So again, it's, it's a good example of being proactive on sustainability. It can give you a lot of new opportunities. And we're also looking at the new regulations as everyone's sort of scratching their head as uh, how we're going to solve this. The, the new regulations coming out of EU, one of the important things is the red uh, uh, ring there is the emission trading scheme. That's in effect for many different uh, businesses. But from next year, it's, in, it's planned. The final regulation is not in, plan, uh, not in place yet, but the trilogue is uh, ongoing within the EU. But uh, that means that shipping will have to be included in the emission trading scheme. That means that we need to pay 
for the emissions. And someone needs to pay for that. Hopefully that we are able to transfer that through the value chain. Because you in the end, uh, we in the end, as end consumers, we, w we are willing to actually to pay that extra cents in order to make sure that the, the products that we buy are sustainable. So we see that as a big change coming uh, for the next um, uh, for the for next year, uh, when that's starting to, to get an effect, because it will be an effect for our customers, because it will be they have to pay less tax in order to transport with oil fuel, because we're going to transfer that cost to them. Another element that I think is quite undercommunicated is scope three. Um, compared to many other differences, our major emissions is in scope one. Scope three is a small part within with our industry. And that's different from, from most other industries. But we are representing a lot of scope three for a lot of others. So many of you uh, representing companies, we are a part of your scope three. And, and I think that the regulations that we see coming up, we see the uh, regulation we see in the US with other countries, with the new corporate sustainable reporting directives here, here in the EU, will put a, a light on the, uh, the emissions. Uh, and with the, the emission trading scheme, we are able to produce the, the CO2 footprint of the products that's been transferred. And that's the scope three. So we see more and more customers coming to us and say that they need the footprint of the product, which is their scope three. And I think that that is also a, a driver. I think it's going to be very challenging to regulate uh, scope three. I think it's a good start to actually talk about it and present it and let the market uh, uh, be aware of it. Because we as responsible consumers, we want to take actions uh, and it's up to us to, to decide. So our path on, uh, on decarbonization goes between uh, we need to have a fuel flexible engine. Uh, we will have to work with a state of the art energy efficiency. That's going to be our next vessel. With our current fleet, we need to really, really focus on energy efficiency, and we also do minor projects uh, related to fuel cells. That's our targets uh, going forward. So uh, the question here is that where is it uh, going back to the green shipping? Is it a is it a sunrise or a sunset for, for, for green shipping? I think that there is a great momentum at the moment. Uh, I don't believe that, uh, the, that the, the, some of these things that came up the, through the summer with the criticism of ESG, uh, I think there's a great momentum. I see the regulation, regulation in the US, the Inflation Act, actually, where uh, they have actually linked the uh, climate investments into the, uh, as a measure to tackle um, uh, inflation. I think this is a good, good uh, things that's coming. And also the regulations, as I mentioned, from the EU and the IMO is coming. Uh, from the energy perspective, I think that the, the situation where we see now where countries need uh, see the need to have a secure and independent access to energy. And for countries that do not have access to uh, fossil fuel, they need to develop their own uh, their, their own new renewable energy or uh, new energy. I think that nuclear has to be a part of the future uh, energy mix based on the challenges that I, provide, uh, that I presented with regards to access to, to energy. But I think that the, this situation where we are at the moment, this kind of energy crisis, will be an accelerator in order to improve on renewable energy. And we, d we do not have any alternative. Uh, if we're going to have summers like we have had for the next years coming, we have one third of, of Pakistan on the water. That's not sustainable. So we need to do something about it. And I think that, that has shown that everyone's believed that. That big guy on the outside of the ring has actually entered the ring now. So on a positive note, I think that if you're going three years back, no one will, no would, <laughs> would have expected that today we are, most of us is actually vaccinated for a disease that we didn't know about three years ago. Imagine what people can do. Imagine what people can do if they kind of started realizing the challenges of that big guys that come, come into the ring now. And I think that that is a kind of my hope uh, that, uh, that we were able to do that. And the last thing is that um, uh, there will be a lot of changes in shipping. Uh, we are standing before a major transition. And if you want to be a part of that change, if you want to affect that change, be the change, then you should join shipping. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, Yasta, and some really interesting insights into what you guys are doing. I think the work that, that you're doing um, with green chipping is really important and really impressive as well. Uh, just a couple of quick questions from me. Um, you were talking about regulation there and how that will, will impact and actually probably drive this, this transition to greener fuels anyway. Um, how will the inclusion of shipping in the EU's emission trading scheme affect shipping? So uh, that means that uh, we see that as a, an opportunity for us because you will have the freight cost and then you will have a carbon tax put on top. Like when you're going to take a taxi, if you have to pay for the CO2, if you had a taxi that emitted more, you would have to pay more taxi. Uh, more tax and, and a higher cost on taking that taxi. The alternative is that you take a, a taxi with a lower emission uh, or an electrical taxi. With, we don't have to pay for it. And I think that that will drive and incentivize ship owners to invest in decarbonization. So that, I think that that is a, a, a good effect of the ETS. What I'm concerned about is that we will pay a lot of money into the European Union. Uh, and uh, Unless that money goes back into the industry as a CO2 fund to drive this transition, it will just be another tax. It will just increase the cost. If that money goes into some, something else, subsidize something else, uh, that's no, no, not solving the problem. So my point is that I really want to have that money coming back to shipping, back to R&D, back to technology, back to infrastructure. Um, and uh, some of the proposals on the table is a, is a kind of an ocean fund, uh, but we are excited to see how that will turn out. Okay, and you talked, um, you talked extensively early on in the presentation there about the different fuel options, and towards the end you mentioned um, nuclear as an option as well. So if you had to select one, what do you think the future fuel will be for shipping? I, I, I think it's, uh, it will not be a, a single answer to that, because uh, as I tried to uh, explain earlier, there are many, many different, fer uh, many different uh, ships. You can have the ferries that can go on batteries. If you're going to have a batteries on one of the vessels that I showed, you need another six, seven vessels with batteries just to power the first one. So, uh, so there will be multiple fuels going forward. And I think that what I'm trying to illustrate is that the fuel itself, uh, it's not really the problem. The problem is how do you produce that fuel? Uh, and how do you actually manage to get that from a well to tank, well to wake perspective to make that fuel green? So I think that ammonia has a, good of, uh, a lot of good capabilities. It's highly toxic uh, uh, and uh, it's kind of a, a nasty stuff, but, but, but from an energy perspective, it's good. Uh, on nuclear, I, I think that the illustration with, with regards to the requirements of renewable energy or, or, or energy going forward, I think that that has to be a part of the mix. I think it would be challenging to put a nuclear reactor on a, on a vessel. I think that that should be a part of the fuel production uh, and, and integrated into, into the grid. Uh, but uh, I know that can be kind of a controversial, but, uh, but um, I think that we need to investigate all opportunities in order to solve this. Okay. Are there any, actually, it, does anyone have a question for Thor? Okay, I can only take one question because we are a bit short of time. So you two fight it out over who wants to ask it. And we don't have the microphone, so if you can please maybe just raise your voice and just say who you are and just be as loud as you can with your question. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, the, the question is, was about our intensity reduction, absolute reduction. So, our ab uh, abs uh, from uh, 21, uh, from 20 to 20 day one, uh, our absolute reduction is zero, and the reason for that is that we have increased the fleet, so we have improved efficiency, we have taken on more vessels, and we have been able to to, to run them more efficiently. But in total, the amount of CO2 that we emitted is the same as we did the year before. So, but that needs to be looked at in a, in a total perspective. So if you have a, a ship owner that's, that's uh, have intensity on the agenda, it will be beneficial to have them, them running these ships than the, the alternative that it will be run by someone else. So we need, to, we need to think about the absolute reductions and, and uh, trying to make that big step and where the intensity target is a measure in order to achieve that. 
Okay, that's all we've got time for there. Thank you very much, Yoiston. Yep, thank, thank you. you.